Hello, book clubbers. Welcome to the last episode of 2023. Very exciting. I'm Jeff Kanata. I'm here with Lana Bashinsky. Hi, Lana. How are you? Hello. I'm so good. I totally didn't realize it, but I'm in the birthplace of our theme song. I'm staring at the speakers that originally spat out the beautiful dance that we or song that we get to dance to every time here. I'm in my sister's place still. Just tailing up the holidays and having a good time, ready to talk more book. That's right. The amazing Emily Bashinsky wrote that theme song. And I could tell there was a little extra groove uh, in your moves. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I appreciate I feel it. it. The vibes, immaculate. <laughs> Hope everybody had a wonderful holiday and uh, are gearing up for a, a, a fantastic new year. We got a lot to get through. We got three chapters this week, uh, finishing up a sub book in House of Chains, the third novel of the Malazan. Book of the Fallen. And uh, man, there's there's tons of juicy stuff to talk mm-hmm. about. But we always start the show with a uh, with a non-spoiler section. Uh, oh, this one verges a little bit. This one will be about the book in sort of general terms. Uh, we got a suggestion from a member of the audience, and we love getting those. So we always prioritize what you want to talk about, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, sent to us at dlcfeedback at gmail.com. This comes from Alex Banks, who writes, uh, Good morning, I just watched your latest book club episode on chapter 7 and 8. Awesome insights. But I also had a fun thought for a spoiler-free intro. Try giving Malazan characters goofy theme songs. <laughs> <laughs> he said, two off the top of my head. Carsa Orlong, Chains of Love by Erasure. Mm-hmm. By the way, huge Erasure fan right here. I love Erasure. Same. Break these chains of love. Don't give up. Yeah. Perfect Corsa, <laughs> Carsa Orlong song. Uh, and then Lestara Yill, Alex says, Maniac by Michael Cimbello. Do you know that song? I assume so. Like the famous song. Maniac. 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 Yeah. I don't know. Is that, is that what it is? Anyway. That's the one I assumed it was. I don't know if Michael Cimbello made, wrote that. Uh, anyway. <laughs> I probably should have looked it up before we started recording. But it's a great, this is a great idea. We love this. So uh, Lana and I just spent the last, I don't know, five minutes <laughs> thinking of some, <laughs> some, some theme songs. And hopefully you watching will uh, also join in on the fun. Maybe post some good suggestions for character theme songs uh, on this video uh, or email them to us. We love hearing from you. You can post them in our Discord as well, which is 5 by 5 DLC on Discord. Uh, but we'd love to hear your theme song for characters, but Lana, I know you have a few and uh, we didn't talk about this, but maybe I'll just spring it on you. Uh, Maybe uh, sing a few bars of each one that you uh, come up with. Perfect. I feel great about that. (laughs) I will say that like singing a few bars of an established song feels great. When you first told me the (laughs) suggestion for the topic, I was worried that this suggestion was for us to improv makeup theme songs for characters. (laughs) And let me tell you, I was going to do it, but I was, I was going to hate it. <laughs> uh, My name yeah. is Whiskey Jack and I, you know, like, whatever. And I should have <laughs> went to physio. Uh, <laughs> uh, so the first one, you know, I'm going to take it right off the table because I feel like it's an, an obvious one. I, I will say I had two for Coltane, our boy. Uh, at first, oh, you know, yeah. I went the sad route with the long and winding road. Ah, oh, that's good. The long and winding road that leads to your door where I will die. I mean, no spoilers. <laughs> no spoilers. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay. I'll mark uh, it in the video. It's okay. But uh, then by the, the way, I, oh. now I, I feel like I've been hoisted <laughs> on my own petard because you sing amazingly. Uh, I forgot about that. <laughs> but I will say... Then something, a more obvious answer came to me. And the better answer is Who Let the Dogs Out 
<laughs> the chain of dogs. That's perfect. <laughs> perfect. Which everybody knows, and I won't sing a few bars. <laughs> who, who, who? Coltane, lift the door. <laughs> yeah. Uh, all right. I have one. I don't even think this song has lyrics, but it just popped into my head. Uh, Heboric should get the the hand jive song from Greece. <laughs> <laughs> we go together like we're that, 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 yeah, the, the, yeah shanana shanana's hand jive song from uh from greece <laughs> ghost hands sold ghost uh, that's hands. really funny i love uh, that all right what's your next one I, I did a carsa i went for a carsa yeah uh weirdly the first thing that popped in my head is eyes that buy but i did again think of a better one which is the sign by ace of bass I saw the sign. <laughs> up my eyes. I saw That's so the perfect. It's so perfect. Mm-hmm, His eyes mm-hmm. were opened up. Yeah. I love that. Uh, all right. My next one is um, <laughs> <laughs> it's our buddy Kalam, who, as we know in our point in our story, is having some relationship issues, you know, and, <laughs> and he's in uh, Raraku. So, uh, and I miss you. Like the desert misses the rain, and I miss you. You know everything but the girl. <laughs> oh, I feel that mood. I could, I could like picture this, like the cinematic, him just looking sad, walking through the desert by himself. I yeah. love that. Yeah. This next one is a bit of a weirdie, but yeah. you got a picture. That is the number of Warrens being listed for Quick Ben. I got Mambo number five. <laughs> <laughs> that actually, I think that fits really well because he just got no cares. He's like, yeah, yeah. Mambo number five. Yeah, I love it. Uh, yeah. Which um, anybody who doesn't, am I singing each one? Yeah, for I real? want you to because you're amazing oh, at singing. God. But I've like chose terrible out. songs for that. <laughs> one, two, a three, four, five. Everybody in the car goes, so come on, let's ride to the liquor store around the corner. Boy said, I want some Ginny juice, but I really don't want to. Wow. I don't remember the part That's where he actually starts counting things. That's incredible. It's the first part. We had to mm-hmm. learn how to line dance to it in high school. <laughs> Anyone else? Is, all I remember from that song is Mambo number five. Yeah, ah, that's right. All right, I got one. Um, <laughs> our girl Felicin. <laughs> don't stand, don't stand so, <laughs> don't stand so close to me. <laughs> the police. You know, oh, that's good. I was actually tempted to go with a different police song for her. Uh, <laughs> Roger. <laughs> you don't need to put on the red lights. Ah. that's good all right you have any more i do i have have three more all right (laughs) uh i got four uh krupp Mm, good old i don't know if anybody's familiar with i don't know why like maritime tunes popped in my head for this (laughs) uh but (laughs) donkey riding if anybody's heard i don't know who wrote it originally but as made popular quote-unquote popular by canadian band great big c Wow. Have Don't you know been to Miramichi where you tie up to a tree and the girls sit on your knee riding on a donkey? Way, hey, and away we go. Donkey riding, a donkey riding. Hey, hey, and away we go. Riding on a donkey. That's amazing. Perfect Krupp <laughs> song. Perfect Krupp song. Um, um, th- this is the last one that I came up with. Uh, I have our, our friends Corball Brooch and uh, Beauchelaine. <laughs> a little, I felt like a little Oingo Boingo was very appropriate. It's mm. a dead man's party. Bam, 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 <laughs> who could ask for more? Bam, 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 bam. Everybody's coming. Leave your body at the door. Leave uh. your body and soul at the door. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's so perfect. Even when you said, you know, what was, the, what was that creepy duo's name? I was like, I don't know what song you're picking, but I'm delighted that that was your <laughs> go to. Uh, I've got two more. Pretty simple. Cutter. Very obvious. Bad Romance by Lady Gaga. <laughs> yes, that's so good. Um, I really don't want to sing that one. You don't have to. You don't have to. You, you already... <laughs> She's, Lady Gaga is so good that I would just murder it. <laughs> I'll sing all the maritime ditties y'all want because nobody knows what I'm talking about. <laughs> uh, and then finally, I did one for the sappers in general. And mm. it's just turned down for what? <laughs> that's perfect. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> That's my list. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
<laughs> I'm trying to think who's a who's a, who's our most famous sapper. I mean, it's Fiddler, but yeah, he's right. less he's, manic he's the less now. Cra- the least crazy of the so, of the uh, sappers. Cu- uh, cuddle, yeah, would cuddle. be the next one. You don't want me in the cuddle. It's, it's, Dur- it's down for what? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so good. Yeah. So good. Well, that was a delightful. Uh, <laughs> Uh, it was topic. wonderful to hear you sing, and you know we endured hearing me sing. So that was fun <laughs> for everybody. Um, <clears throat> thank you, Alex, for sending that in. If you have a suggestion for our opening topic of the show, please send them to us, dlcfeedback at gmail.com. All right, let's get into it. Official spoilers starting now for chapters 9, 10, and 11 of House of Chains. We start chapter 9 with uh, Kalam just doing a little shopping. You know, just uh, in the store, you, know, you got to get got to get some new knives. Uh, really interesting scene, I thought. Yeah. Of, of in, this interaction with this merchant uh, who kind of has these amazing things, doesn't really either doesn't know or doesn't want to reveal where uh, they got them, them from specifically. Uh, but there's cer- certain observations that Callum makes uh, or Kalam makes about, um, you know, he finds out that you know this 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 shopkeeper um has an ototoral knife which and he's like I, I want that and then the, the really interesting negotiation where the shopkeeper actually is like I won't take all of your diamonds I'll mm-hmm. give you take half cuz you know I'm cool that, that's I'm a fair cool shopkeeper yeah I, what did you make of this scene I thought it was interesting uh did you like obviously when the scene starts and we're just getting, you know, he said, they said, yeah. there's like, who are we talking to? Who's, who's in the, who's in the scene? Right. Um, I definitely didn't guess Kalam until it said Kalam on the page, but the whole time I'm like, who is it? I know it's going to be somebody we know. Right. Um, or maybe, you know, after last week I should stop <laughs> assuming, assuming <laughs> so, something is amiss in every page. Um, uh, so interesting like the lead up to like keep Kalam veiled until later in the scene yeah um but I think it's interesting like these these glimpses of you know it's so clear when a character to me is supposed to be like a piece of garbage this person sucks like lots of nobles that we met they suck these people you know that when they're just bad to be around bad for everybody that they come in contact with they just they suck yeah. and a shopkeeper like this where there there's that suspicion of like how did this guy get in in possession of these things is there some shady things happening probably maybe but there's he's still afforded like a legit a legitimacy looking in the bag of diamonds and being like half but half of this is is more is more than enough so even admitting i'm taking more from you because you know i can tell that you want it and that's right right as a shopkeeper it's interesting to, to have some character be framed I always think it's interesting when a character is framed in, in legitimacy and you often get the bridge burners finding these people who have like this authenticity to them. I always right. like those moments. Um, but then the, uh, I don't remember Coltane having an Atatarl blade. Was it implied? It was implied that it was Coltane's this... or part of the Crow clan yeah, or I don't just think had crow he... feathers on it. Yeah. He, I don't think he, I think he basically says it's not Coltane's. Okay. Um, because he only had one, long knife like one bigger yes. knife he's like this is definitely not coltane so that's not the wiccan whose blade this is so I, we, so we don't really get any clarity on whose, whose blade this is and why it's so special mm-hmm. but he does theorize that it is was blessed by a thelemen toblikai which is like what and yes. then he's like who could it have been maybe it was high mage bellardan skull crusher <sighs> yes i uh yeah, I totally forgot about that part. Yeah, it was the it was the Toblakai time that was like the the yeah, interesting, interesting part. And I think and, there's still sort of mystery around that, but there's a lot of stuff with his blade and the fact that he's got this blade is a big deal. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's so, like a long dagger; it's like a short sword, right? Yeah, right. For for anybody else, it would be right because he's <laughs> yes. he's like a big dude. Yeah. Uh, all right. So <clears throat> in the next scene, uh, we're still with um, Kalam, and he's he's um, riding on his horse. And he uh, he comes upon this camp, uh, pretends to be, he says his name is Olfas, uh, mm-hmm. which is the name of this Bargast chief that he killed. And he um, meets a bunch of soldiers, uh, including Sin, 
and uh, Iriz, the uh, the corporal of the Ashok regiment. Um, and there's kind of this weird tete-a-tete of like him feeling them out, them feeling him out, him lying to them about who he is. But he's also like, I'm here to join the crew and fight. I'm here to, I'm here to party? Yeah, I'm um, here to party. Uh, it, it, see, this is why it was interesting to me to have like this experience with the shopkeeper so you can feel like the authenticity and then coming into the, another one of these situations where there's clearly, clearly something, somebody that I always envision as like a petulant baby person trying to yeah. run the show. Right. And it's like the facade of, of competence versus actual sort of competence. Yeah. Um, I liked the, that sort of play between these two scenes. Um, but this is, I think where Kalam comes in and he's like, okay, I'll like snuggle into your ranks or whatever, but you're not giving me orders. I'm here to do right. the thing I'm here to do. Uh, and I will, you know, be ordered by this person, but that's not, I'm not actually going to, that's not the point of whatever's happening here. Um, right. I thought it was just an interesting way to in- immediately identify, oh, this is a, a weak person who doesn't know what they're talking about. I can immediately just tell them what to do. It was great. Yeah. Yeah, and and you you get the sense that he doesn't trust them. They don't trust him. Sin is like this kind of weird chaos agent where she's kind of like throwing in, you know, uh, undercutting uh, terms and, and you know, mm-hmm. insults. It, it was a really interesting dynamic. And then the next scene, immediately him sneaking out and seeing her and realizing, oh, they're on the same side. Mm-hmm. She is, and, and him sort of recognizing, oh, you were feeling me out. You were poking and prodding me to see which side I was really on because you are a double agent, basically. You are yeah. uh, insinuating yourself with these uh, people and, and to destroy them. And she's going to sabotage these siege towers. He's like, are you sabotaging the siege towers? Cool, because that's I was here to sabotage the siege towers. Like, that's- <laughs> Except for this one, which is the Malazan one, which is the dope one. Yeah, um, right. Uh, one of the things I think is interesting that I'll probably touch more on it later is how the like sins – immediate like i'm not going near him he's got that otara blade yeah that's not and uh, i think it gives me the idea that otara blades in general obviously they've been important because they are spooky scary from ages but also like signs of of important stature sort of in in the lesson society but seeing we know the adjunct gets uh, that's one of the status symbols of the adjunct Mm -hmm. is receiving an otara sword yeah. But seeing like twice in the, these chapters, like Otaro blades coming up, um, yeah. there's sort of like a repetition that I'm like, these swords are going to be, it feels to me like these swords are going to be a very important part of this book. Um, yeah. And, well, Otaro in general, I feel like we're so massive. interesting stuff. Yeah, yeah. With this, with these chapters, we'll, we'll get to it. Um, but I, I also thought this, this sequence here with Sin being like, oh, and guess what else? Not only am I sabotaging these towers, I also poisoned the water supply. And he's like, oh, oh really? my gosh. What did you poison it with? <laughs> Talb. Uh, oh, oh, Traub. It's Traub. Traub. He's like, oh, s- sweet, 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 sweet. How much Traub did you use? All the Traub. And he's like, no, you oh, used so, like two drops of Traub. No. So uh, you're like brutally torturing yeah. everybody who might take a sip. Yeah. Like just the most like cruel thing you could possibly do to somebody. And Kalam's like, well, now time to murder everybody. That's well, a better I mean, fate. Awesome. I thought of an awesome sort of character building moment for, for Kalam because, you know, he has this moral code, right? He's an assassin, mm-hmm. right? An assassin, you feel like eh, pretty, uh, uh, pretty suspect moral code, but he's yeah. like, I'll kill people, but not like that. My worst yeah. enemies, these people, I'll sabotage the thing. I'll, you know, I'll, I'll undermine their, their command. I'll, you know, destroy stuff, but I don't want to see anyone suffer the fate of tons Trump. of trial. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> because yeah, you I see really what I mean, they're frothing at the mouth and they're going insane and, and they're just and like. And the description of like, uh, oh, that's not like, oh, they're not reaching, they're not close to reaching the conclusion of this. Right. They will continue in this state that is obviously horrible until right. they die of dehydration. Like yeah. they'd be like that for days and days. Terrible. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, he, uh, he, he, as you said, he puts them out of their misery. Some of them, he has this moment where he thinks about the 1300 children, you know, I thought, I mm-hmm. thought of you when that happened. Cause I know you're always uh, thinking about that. It's referenced again. Interesting. Also, um, you know, a- after he does that, he he meets back up with the uh, 
the rest of the troops and makes this deal. Well, first of all, he destroys the diamond that he was given with the Mm -hmm. bone whistle from Cotillion and summons a demon. Oh my gosh. The bone whistle from Cotillion and like the thing being like, you can just blow it once really loudly and all of the diamonds will explode. Yeah. But you're like, that seems interesting. I wonder if that will ever happen. But him like very carefully getting as close as he can to be like, toot, 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 tiniest toot. Yeah. And then <laughs> the absolute monstrosity that pops out of that thing, you're like, don't blow it hard, man. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Careful <laughs> with the whistle. <laughs> uh, uh, such a cool description of a gross demon thing. Yeah. I it's really got human eyes, blue human eyes, like human eyes, and it like smiles. And yeah. uh I, I it feels in my brain, it's like very Miyazaki to me, this yeah. this creature that pops out. Um yeah, yeah, and it proceeds to like run off and start murdering people <laughs> like, in like yeah. like thirty seconds, and it uh, they like collected all of their shadows. Like my understanding is this demon like killed everybody, and the people became a part of the shadow that follows this demon. Like you can yeah. see the the souls that it's taken, or like yeah, in its own shadow. Very interesting. Well, there's um, that crazy moment where it leaps onto this balcony. And it started falling off and then extra shadow hands come out and help it hold on. So mm-hmm. cool. Yeah. Uh, so interesting. It's one of those scenes that I think I'm kind of coming to realize in these novels. And maybe I'm wrong. You can correct me if you think I'm wrong. Mm-hmm. But I feel like there's several scenes where new things are introduced like this. And it's just there for that moment to be awesome. You know, it's like mm-hmm. I always go, oh, this – is a seed for later. And maybe it is, but it feel, feels like there are several scenes now where it's just like, this is just Erickson giving us something awesome right now, you know, yeah. just some cool new thing that I've never seen before. That isn't necessarily there to progress the larger narrative. It's just there to give us kind of an awesome moment. And, and cool and, to and that's see fine. different, different shapes of it because uh, the, like the only thing that would like make me think that it would be there for longer is apt you know, maybe yeah. Kalam's got this demon body now. Right. Um, but, you know, previously, when like the first book, way back in the first book, where they're like, ah, somebody's chasing us through a demon. And then they like run away. That's like yeah. their smoke bomb is like demon. But you don't, you see like the description of it, but then it dies instantly to Animanda Rake. And so right. it seems like they are these very powerful beings that are also very disposable in a way. Right. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, I agree with you. And it also has two penises. We learn. Hell yeah. yeah. And so toxic peepees. And yeah, real stinky. Real it, stinky have, peepees. Maybe it had some asparagus earlier. I was going to say mm-hmm. some Brussels sprout. Yeah. Having a time. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but he makes a deal. Uh, Kalam does with uh, the mage of that, uh, of that group to, Purify the water or dispose of the water, not purify mm-hmm. it, but just, you know, get rid of it. Of the Malazan so, group. Yes. That, that was under siege. That's right. Boat. Yes. Right. He goes and sees them. He's like, hey, you guys are hiding here. You can hide here as long as you want, but also maybe do something nice. And they're like, oh, no, we're not. We don't we don't like those people. Let, let them suffer. And he's like, no, there's suffering. And then there's Traub. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? So I also uh, like that they're like, oh, you think we're like hiding here? There's like a back row. We're. <laughs> We're good. Yeah, we, we, we're fine. <laughs> we could go at we're any good. time. <laughs> yeah, it's very funny. Um, uh, then uh, he, you know, this is uh, Sergeant Cord, Ebron, Bell, Corporal Shard, uh, all, a bunch of new folks, Malazans. Mm-hmm. I always, I've been wondering lately if like there's some registry of uh, of cool Malazan soldier <laughs> nicknames. So if you're like, uh, you know, you're like, oh. I'm the guy who rings bells. Uh, call me Bell. And they're like, sorry, man. Like, it's taken. On the other continent, there's a dude named Bell already. So you can't be called Bell. Ah. Yeah, like, You're going to have to be know. called Tink- t- Tinkle Toes <laughs> Tinkle. now. It's like, ah, dang it. <laughs> I love that, you know, Crocus is like, I want a cool name, like something like, like with cut in it, like cuddle. And they're like, nope, been taken. He's like, sorry, I guess can't cutter. Be cuddle. Cutter. <laughs> Just change a couple of letters. <laughs> okay, good enough. Good enough. Cuttersons? Um, <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, so um, uh, there's some discussion about the demon. Like, uh, you want to mess with this demon? It's killed a whole bunch of people. Um, and uh, Kalama's like, oh, man, 
hanging out with these folks this is not going to be easy. Mm. <laughs> this new new group. New uh, crew. We find out that Captain Kindly is is probably dead. Although mm-hmm. you know, never know. Is he? Is he? Uh, really? Interesting. But we sort of set up uh, Kalam being with this new group of Malazan soldiers and. Uh, what's going to happen there. Then we move away. The next uh, scene is uh, what has become my favorite POV of this novel so far, I think is just checking in with cutter and seeing what he's yeah. thinking about it. I love how these chapters are, or not chapters, but section scenes are written. Um, he's so introspective and it's so beautiful and lyrical the way our, our, you know, the artist formerly known as Crocus uh, thinks about himself Mm. Um, I, I liked these chapters as well because I agree with you. One of my favorite sentences, I actually ended up having like a three hour discussion yesterday about how affected I was by that and like how applicable it was to my life right now. Uh, and your other book club podcast that you do? <laughs> Oh, no, we, I, I, talk, I pulled it out with people who haven't read the book. And I'm like, I read this sentence. And then it was about, it was more therapy for me in my life than it was about the book. I'm um, just teasing. I know, but just to be clear, <laughs> um, I actually am very like, so, you know, folks on the show, my husband, also named Jeff, is reading the books as well. And every once in a while, he'll try and say something to me. I'm like, no, you can't talk to me until after I talk to Kanata. That's... <laughs> The rule. Aww. I don't. I don't talk about the book until we have first reactions. Well, thank so, you. Like, I appreciate um, that. But he is so introspective, and like what he goes through with like trying to like, you know. Speaking of you know Greece, he seems like he's like trying to change himself or like try and be something else for yeah. Um, uh, yeah. Absolar, and she's like it's more of a Greece I... two kind of situation. Yeah. actually. <laughs> yeah, but rather than her being like, yeah, you're so much hotter now, she's like, I really. That's, this is not what I wanted from you. And this is not even what I wanted for myself. Right. Uh, I loved this whole this whole moment. But I also love that we do get a little glimpse of of Crocus um, uh, in the next scene that we get to. So I'll, I'll, yeah, I'll but they've arrived there. at this moving island called the Drift Avali. Or mm-hmm. Avali or... At, Drift or, Avali. Yeah. And um, it's it's pretty rad how this is a moving island untethered to any kind of deeper land mass mm-hmm. and um he's like okay we got there where are we gonna park the boat oh it's kind of rough seas all right here's what i'll do i'll jump off and then i'll <laughs> wah! and then it, it breaks and he falls in the water i like uh, that he's like i'm gonna jump off and then right when he does like the water drops and it's like that's not a solid piece of anything that's, that's a, oh a thin ledge <laughs> so he goes uh crashing into the drink and is rescued by uh, a new character, Darist. Well, pseudo rescued, because my understanding is that he sort of, you know, as fate would have it, fell into right like the one tidal swirl that would spit him out in the middle of the island, and then so he's he's sort of pulled from that the water, the icy water, with like all of his limbs starting to like freeze through. He's yeah. sort of dragged onto land, but. For the most part, he lucked out because what we hear from our newcomer is that everything else would have just killed you. Your friend, she's dead. She's definitely dead. Yeah, but I can I can we look for my girlfriend? I'm sorry, she's dead. But my girlfriend <laughs> is pretty resilient. No, she's dead. Listen, she's dead. <laughs> Are you right. hearing me? Yeah. This is the only one. You did it. <laughs> I don't know how. Anyway, we're gonna die anyway. <laughs> we're all gonna die anyway. <laughs> uh, and some interesting tidbits about the Tisti and D. And this island and Anamana Rake and how um, they have—they were sort of just like <laughs> dropped off at daycare on the island, <laughs> yeah. and then Anamana Rake just like pieced out. You know, He's like, like ba- babysit yourself. Yeah, you'll be don't, fine here on the don't island. Set don't, on don't, don't set it on fire. Worry about it. Don't set it on fire. And uh, our and Crocus lies or Cutter lies about uh, why he's there. He says Baruch sent him. Uh, mm-hmm. To investigate the distant endure. <laughs> this is the part where he sounds like Crocus to me. He's yeah. like, "What? I didn't. I was sent. They're like, who sent you?" He's like, "Brooke. You ever heard of him?" It just sounds like a little sweet dum dum again for just a glimpse. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, and uh, you know, the, so we don't know what's where we leave off with this. Basically, he's like, 
I sense there's presence of of uh, our friend Darist says I sense the presence of the Tisti Edur, and uh, we're about uh, things g- are going to get bad real quick. Mm-hmm. Uh, so let's get out of here. I love the visual of meeting our new buddy. What's his name? Darist. Darist. Or Darist. Yeah. Uh, and you know, Cutter talking to him and being like, "Wow, the only light source is his eyeballs." I know that was rad, right? Uh, I, I love just- that. I loved it. And I could, again, there's so many moments that I can just picture what they would look like and the brightness. And even if you just blinked, how it would yeah. be like this moment of darkness in the whatever cavern yeah. area that they're at. Oh, so cool. Yes. Very cool. And I'm very curious to see where that goes. I mm-hmm. don't believe for a second that we've seen the last of Absalar, uh, but I don't think we're supposed to believe and that. Then, <laughs> yeah. 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 Um, all right. So next scene, uh, still in chapter nine, uh, we check back in with Onrak and Troll Sengar, mm-hmm. uh, our uh, Talana Moss and uh, <laughs> other guy, um, Tisti Idur. Uh, and and I, I love this sequence. <laughs> it's funny. Like, it's funny. They're back and forth. Like, I don't care. I care less than you care. Who, who cares less than uh, me? Not you, I'm, me. <laughs> not you. I've never cared about anything. And also, I could, I, you know, my dad could beat up your dad. I could beat up a dog. <laughs> yeah. Um, and they're speculating about, um, uh, you know, they're talking about these, these statues in front of them, the, 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 the carvings of the hounds, the seven Mm -hmm. hounds of, uh, of shadow. And, uh, there's a really interesting observation about how you, by carving the the face of something, you actually sort of seal it and make it manifest and form the the the, the formation of something makes it real. You know, like a god mm-hmm. turning it. You know, carving the image of a god kind of captures it, which I think is all sort of very much foreshadowing, or not even foreshadowing, but commentary on what's happening with Karsa Orlong too, where he's sort of like carving the images of his gods. And I think capturing them, forming them in that place. I also think it's commentary on what's happening with the deck of dragons and the forming mm. of the house of chains. Yes. Where it's not like a, a carving, but it is, this is the likeness. It's real now. Right. And it sort the of, for me, reality re- is mm-hmm. required to manifest the thing. Yeah. It, it, it reinforces those ideas that like when they were being said in the past book, I'm like, yeah, maybe, or maybe it'll be real bad <laughs> of, you know, making the you know crippled god like <clears throat> validating his house or whatever yeah. it makes him play by our rules was like the idea and when it was that that was being said i'm like maybe and this all seems like it's it's feeding into that idea to me yes uh and we we find out that the the logros talan emas mm-hmm. uh dealt with the first empire and uh, kind of stopped the soul, ca- soul taken and divers big coming out party, mm-hmm. <laughs> which I think is a direct connection to when Haboric and Felicin and Bowden found that cave with the first Empire soul taken that were all sort of like mid transformation and had been murdered by Talana Moss. It's like we know that Onrak and the Logros clan did that like that's what he's talking about it's like i went mm-hmm. had to deal with this they did the ritual and we had to stop it and we saw that place where they went and did that through heberic's eyes mm-hmm. and felicin's eyes which i thought was interesting yeah we find out about the human founder of the beast ritual <laughs> uh Desimbalakis. this is so funny because this aren't they kind of like yeah, human founder of the beast ritual, and then he disappeared. And then weirdly, seven dogs appeared. Yeah, he's like, he, he, <laughs> wait, he was a divers, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. He was. Yeah, he he uh, he veered into divers. Oh, cool, 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 cool. How many creatures did he uh, did he uh, veer into? Seven. And it's like slow pan to the seven <laughs> hound statues. Like, it's probably nothing. <laughs> That's a winky dink. Oh, um, so weird. Lucky number, I guess. <laughs> yeah, but it's it's also there's two of the hounds are trapped in there. And then Onrak in his infinite wisdom is like, I know what I'll do. I'm gonna smack <laughs> it with my sword. I like that he's literally like, I wish there was a hound of shadow right here. I'd 
<laughs> I'd kill it. I get it. I get it. I want to prove I could. And then he's so fun. It'd be so fun to kill a hound. <laughs> Give me a chance. <laughs> oh, like, I'll, 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 I'll make my smack own chance. statue one. <laughs> <laughs> and he's just like, Rrr! and uh, of course, the hounds leap out, just obliterate him instantly. <laughs> I, just, I just see like a dog with a chew toy, and yeah, just, just like him being flopped around, you know, <laughs> this so uh, funny. bony <laughs> skeleton man <laughs> ripping an arm off, hurting him so hard that he literally sunders his vow. <laughs> oh my gosh, he's it's disconnected so... from immortality. <laughs> so. So good. This whole scene, him like the overconfidence of doing that, immediately getting decimated, <laughs> yeah. and then Troll like dragging him out of there, <laughs> and then after being dragged out of there, being like, the vow's broken. <laughs> anyway, and like kind of gets up, and he's like, "Why didn't you do that before? I dragged you, <laughs> yeah, your heavy bony butt out of there." Oh my god! <laughs> it's so funny how it's this uh, reversal of fortune because. Onrak was the one dragging Troll, you know, earlier. Mm -hmm. And when he, you know, he didn't have any strength when he was in the chains and or in the, uh, you know, harness. And uh, now that it, I love how that role is reversed, and you know, the other one was, and then he's like, "Wow, you could have walked this whole time." Very funny, <laughs> very funny. Uh -oh. uh, and they come upon uh, some some bombs, some Maranth, uh munitions, play bombs, munitions. Yeah. Which I think are the ones that Torvald Nam had mm -hmm. and let go. So that was interesting. He's like, "Oh, we got. I found bombs. What? Do we, what should we do? Maybe we should mm -hmm. throw them at the magic gate seal." Okay. And they're like, "I mean, I don't have any better ideas." <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Boom. Uh, and he's like, "Oh, we. <laughs> These guys are just like." <laughs> Just like bumbling, you know, like, oh, I'll let the hounds go. He's like, those aren't hounds of shadow. Those are like the original those ones had OG shadows bad hounds. underneath them. Those yeah. were just dogs. Those were real, those are way worse. And we have no idea what we've unleashed. <laughs> anyway, let's throw a bomb over there and see what happens. <laughs> and then oh, they do that. We summoned some <laughs> jerks, I guess. Some jerks. <laughs> we blew open the door and jerks came out. <laughs> So we get to meet these completely new people um, that are uh, obsessed with purity. They're Tisti Leosin. <laughs> I think it's actually supposed to be Tyst, but I can't bring myself to say Tyst. The only thing I so I was thinking about it so much. I think it's I think it's just Tist. Tist, but like tist. It, they, the e sound, the vowel sound connects to the next word. So Tist and D, Tisti Dur, mm. Tis Leon. It like yeah. Yeah, makes right. one kind of nice. I like Tisty word. though. Uh, I do too. It's all but right. these are Tistliosins. Uh, they're obsessed with purity and follow the Father of Light or Father Light. Do we know Father Light at all? No, but we know Mother to... Dark. So I feel like yeah, you know, makes sense. Makes sense. and Amanda Rake is the ah. the the son of Mother Dark. I feel like it all. You know, there's a mm -hmm. symmetry there. Mm -hmm. um, but I, this scene tickled me because <laughs> of this exchange between a bunch of just pompous a-holes, you know, and they're just out <laughs> pompousing each other like, oh, well, you, uh, I'm, shall I destroy them? No, I'll destroy you. Well, if you give me a chance, we should all destroy each other. It's just so funny how it's, they interact. It's so funny and like, Clearly, like, you've never come up against a day of, like, somebody coming against you in your entire life. Right. So, you have the one guy who's like, listen, here, Boneman, <laughs> uh, you will respect me now. And he's like, no. And he's like, <gasps> and, like, the other one comes in yeah. and is like, you can disrespect him, Boneman, but listen to me. And he's like, no. And he's like, <gasps> <laughs> like, he's so like, great. it makes sense that you wouldn't respect him. He's the young one, but moi, it was like so, <laughs> yeah. so good, so good. And and also on the other side, them being like, you know, I've been looking for a new peoples to start murdering because uh, <laughs> yeah. we love just murdering pompous a holes. And, I've uh, been saying for. <laughs> eons that we needed the new people to eradicate yeah. and i think you're a great candidate you will 
serve <laughs> for a short while uh, to <laughs> stave off my boredom by annihilating you. And like, they're all just like posturing and nobody does it. It's like that, the thing on the playground where it's like, oh, you're glad, I'm glad he's holding me back. Cause yeah. I would mess you up, man. Man, grab my arm, grab my arm. <laughs> yeah, grab it. Yeah. The, so uh, oh, we totally forgot like their initial, they like throw the bomb at the gate and like the whole start to everything is they kind of look at it and then uh, the, what's his name? Onrak is like, bro, you better run, dude. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And so, you know, Troll <laughs> is like just legging it into the distance, like by himself. Yeah. And then like Onrak basically trying to like clothesline stab these people off their horses, just like leaping into the fray and then having like this useless little battle for like one second before all of the posturing happens. It's like really yeah. an explosive in both, you know, physicality and attitude of these people instantly. It's just good. It's really good. Very really funny. Good stuff. And then, of course, new uh, bone casters show up mm -hmm. and just materialize out of the ground. And they're like, should we hand over the prisoner? Like, you haven't established <laughs> a prisoner here yet. <laughs> yeah. Very funny. And well, they're like, the, the, well, I love them being like, he's our prisoner. You can't just have him. And they like kind of take one step towards him. And they're like, actually, we've decided we'll release him. No, you don't have to. No pressure. No pressure. Everything's yeah, fine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know what? On second thought, you may you may permit you to have our prisoner. <laughs> yeah. And then Very them funny. turning to Troll being like, if you would like, you could serve us. <laughs> yes. And you can accept it by bowing to me if immediately. And he's we like, I think I'll stick with that. will allow you to be our servant. <laughs> It's very funny. Very uh, funny stuff. I thought it was a, a, a pu almost pure comedic scene, which is very fun. These other Talana Moss that show up, these are the ones I was assuming that we saw earlier who like showed up on the boat and they're like, hmm. But they're new ones. They're fully new this ones. This is Monarch Ochem. I don't think we ever got any of their names before. Yeah. I've never, I don't recall seeing Monarch Ochem. I don't before. recall the description of like the fur from the one growing up over yeah. their head like a hood or something like that was really cool. Yeah. yeah. So maybe they did. The, the, the other thing that's funny is they're like, oh, we serve uh, Osric, son of Father Light. And like, oh, yeah? What, have you seen him lately? No. I don't want to talk about that. <laughs> I'm sure he's. he said he was leaving for, a, for some milk, and I know he'll come back. <laughs> Daddy said Daddy would <laughs> never lie. <laughs> and they're like, okay, how do we get out of here? Well, we need to do a ritual. Using t the the Telon Warren. Oh, cool, cool, cool. That's that's your Warren. Yes, yes, yes. But we need Tisti Idur blood. <laughs> and Troll's like, Oh, where are you gonna get? Oh, that's me. My blood. Oh, oh. cool. And he's like, Not sweet, all sweet, of sweet, it. Sweet. If we don't mess it up, <laughs> not, not all of it. <laughs> Very funny. Very funny. Yeah. All right. That was the end of chapter nine. Chapter ten starts with uh, Carsa Orlong, our buddy. Just out in the woods, out just the doing his pit. art, making his art. So I want to be what people are making art. Uh, and <laughs> that's a, that's a Mr. I, Show reference. I assume it's a quote, but. <laughs> Mr. Show. Um, and uh, he's just, you know, carving away, uh, making, tr working real hard to make him look right. Mm -hmm. I'm not getting it. Not getting those faces just right. I love hard. the the observation and I wasn't sure if it was like trying to reveal something about the gods or trying to reveal that he'd gotten something wrong. Yeah. But, uh, it's interesting. You know, we saw that he was in, in the, the glade before and he, he'd carved bear off and, and Delam Thord. And I think, you know, Shaikh was like, are you going to put your gods in the other ones? He's like, I don't know yet, but he has, and now he's been working on them for a minute. But as he's talking, like, like Leoman comes and talks to him in this scene. Right. But yeah. he, what Carsa sees in his carvings is he goes, ah, it's the lighting makes it weird. The lighting makes the faces I carve look like human. Yeah. And I wasn't sure if that was him saying that he got it wrong or trying to insinuate something about what the gods are. I think it's the, the latter. At least that was my reading was that him, it, it's, it's him continuing to see the fault in the gods themselves. And they're mm. like, they're not that far from human slash fallible. Mm. You know, they're not, they're not so great, basically, yeah. is what my take was. It's like, oh, in a different light, you know, metaphor, metaphor, in a different light, this is this seems all wrong. It doesn't seem as grandiose and uh, worthy of my 
devotion as mm-hmm. it, it, it I used to think it was. And he carved them all at eye level, which I really liked yeah. just yeah. medically. But meanwhile, the the you know Byroth or I always do that. Bayroth, uh Bayroth and uh Delam are you know Spot the perfect on. lysis. They, they are they are clear, they are uh worthy of that precision and uh, you know, so he's he's really saying like they were right the whole time. Bayroth in particular was right the whole time to doubt this. And he has that wonderful line about finally being his father's son, which yeah. I thought was uh, amazing. Um, but you're right. Leo man comes in and they kind of just kind of talk about uh, finding out some, they talk about the, the carvings, but they also talk about finding out about distant Malazan defeats. Um, everybody's kind of getting the word that things went bad with the Penny and Domen. Mm-hmm. And um, I think it's interesting that Carsa is kind of like, well, the, the Malazan, he has that wonderful speech about justice and the, how the Malazan Empire actually values justice. And so he respects them more than mm-hmm. he even respects Shaikh, Shaikh and the whirlwind and the rebellion uh, because they are just there to create chaos. And he's like, I actually care about justice. Yeah, they're hungering for the same power that the Malazans have, but so they can use it also <laughs> against their own people. Right. Yeah. Subjugate their own people. Um, yeah. Um, all right. Then we, uh, we have this, uh, scene in Shaikh's council from, um, what's his name's, perv- uh, the, the fists POV. Oh no, this yeah. is Heboric. Excuse me. Mm. Uh, Heboric is there. Um, and <laughs> this is wonderful, uh, scene where, um, they're looking at the, the, the new, cards in the deck of dragons and she's like heboric uh what do you see what do you see what do you see and he's like you've asked me that so many times he's like well rub it in not <laughs> yeah. much i still I'm blind <laughs> yeah um but what he does actually see is that the master of the deck is uh paran or is mm-hmm. Ganoz, uh her brother and he's standing in a such a way that he looks like a sword and he's yeah. standing on a bridge that's burning. What could that possibly mean? <laughs> um, <laughs> with a bunch of soldiers uh, who on knows, the bridge. Who knows with metaphors? Who knows? <laughs> uh, I love them describing this. like Because it was like coming into a picture of this guy. Because his arms are outreached and his feet. He's like, where are his feet? She's like, I know that you know something. And yeah. so when you're describing them almost impossibly close together. Yeah. And like, uh, I just, I loved the reveal of this and how they described the cards to Heberic for him to then sort of spit back hints of of what it is to Shaikh, and she's like, "I know, I know." Just like confirm yeah. my suspicions, basically. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and then we have a, a, a scene where uh, Felicin the younger takes Heberic away and is like, "Wow, you really, you really didn't help my mom very much. You know what you need to do? You're going to need to retrace your steps in reverse." Uh, which is, I, I love this kind of beautiful symmetry that's being drawn here where he's like this awesome thing of this jade statue that you touched is the cause of all the problems in fact the entire island of Otateral was created to trap this one thing mm-hmm. such an awesome revelation that it's such an awesome because like uh heberg thought that the those that thing came and like came with the Otateral and spat it all out. Yeah. And it was like, no, it was created to trap it. It was like such a, a good like twisting there. They're, yeah, are, they, are they related? Yeah, definitely. But in a, like sort of a spookier way. Yeah. And like the fact that he touched the statue, it gave an avenue for whatever was being contained is now out and it's within him. Ooh. Yeah, you've got it and it's bad. And we got to go put it back where it came from and put the, the genie back in the bottle and cork mm-hmm. that thing. Mm-hmm. And she's like, how will we do it? Well, you should really go back, but you know what? You can't go alone. I'll go with you. I'm Felicin. And you know what we need is a, like a warrior to join us. It's like, and Hebrick's like, ah, it's too, too real, too, too you know. Too. Yeah. <laughs> I love that that it's a sort of like organically creating just, it, it, it reminds me of, you know, putting your finger on the, on the record, on the record player and trying to play it in reverse. Mm-hmm. You know, it's, they're trying to, reverse engineer this bad thing which i think you know you can't you can't put the genie back in the bottle yeah uh, but mm. really cool that 
you know, she's just sort of like, I'll go with you and we'll get a, you know, we'll get a, a, a big boy, big boy. And it'll just be, it'll be completely unique. And no one has ever done this before. <laughs> really cool. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and then we're back with Carsa and Leo Man's like, uh, Hey man, uh, we should, we should walk. He's like, yeah, well, I, you want me to just run next to your horse? Because there's no horses big enough for me. He's like, ah, oh, but there are big horses. Mm -hmm. There's big horses right over there. He's like, oh, I want them big horses. I want to He's ride like, the big horses. And then isn't he like, okay, great. Go get one. And then as soon as you're done, come back and get me. <laughs> right. Right. He's uh, like, yes. sends him on his own. Yep. And he goes, uh, you know, we have to, we have to hurry because, um, you know, stuff's changing. There's this whole house of chains. And he's like, house of what now? House of the <laughs> thing like, I've been dreaming of? Uh, my house? Yeah. Is that my house? Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. Interesting. Mm hmm a little worrisome. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Carson's yeah. like, maybe I belong there. Maybe I, I like belong I that. <clears throat> I feel like I don't know enough about like the deck and all the things that would be contained within a house. Like for me, the thing I was thinking is like, are is everything that is part of that house a good thing for that house? Or is there a dissonant that lives in the house? Is there right. somebody who is like a, a rebelling element within each house? Um, yeah, very curious though. Very curious. And then Carsa has this moment where he literally starts talking to the statues that he carved. Um, the faces of the seven, uh, start speaking to him and are like, Hey, destroy those Bayroth and Delam Thord ones. We don't like those. Those are not, not cool. Also, <laughs> uh, I need you to, you know, I need you to j go on a journey for us. And he's like, ah, I, I, I don't, I'm not the man I used to be. I don't need to follow these gods anymore. In I also fact, like the, I like Delam and Bayroth, Bayroth more. And Delam and Bayroth are like, yeah, yeah, yeah. We heard that. We're cool. What's up, we're, we're, what's up war leader? Hey. Yeah. 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 I like uh, that he like carves these faces and he's talking to them and they're like, finally, we've been waiting a really long time for you to carve these faces for us. Yeah, right. Um, totally. Uh, I think. In reference to what we were talking about before, with that whole speech with Onrak saying you need to, in order to make it manifest, you have this physical representation. And I feel like that's exactly what happens with the, the face of the seven. Like we needed mm -hmm. you to make us real so we could, we have a vessel to be inside. Mm -hmm. uh, and the same thing with the, with the, the souls of Bayroth and Delm Thord, they have a place to live and then they can communicate with him. Mm. Uh, and there's this beautiful moment where he falls to his knees and starts crying. And you really feel like, wow, Carsa Orlong has come so far. You know, mm -hmm. he's really transitioned away from that, you know, brash and reckless. Frat boy. Yeah. Frat boy. Yeah. Yeah. Um, all right. Then we have this, this scene where Haboric is like building his dung fire. Dung fires <laughs> just seem... Seem real foul, really disgusting. To everybody me. seems like they're like into it. It's a coveted resource. Yeah. And I get it, but it's the stanks. I can't. I mean, Erickson never <laughs> mentions the stank specifically, but I'm always imagining the stank. <laughs> yeah. you know? There's never a time where somebody says dung fire and I'm like, seems pleasant. Seems like a real delightful tent to Can't be wait to get my Tootsie's toasty near the dung fire. Uh, but he's thinking about death. He's like, maybe, you know, maybe if I just die, I don't want to have to walk back to the statue. Mm -hmm. Maybe if I just die, it won't be bad. Maybe it'll be good that I, maybe, maybe it, me dying does not unleash the Jade statue creature. Maybe it stops it from being unleashed. Maybe. Maybe. You, know, <laughs> you don't know. If we don't uh, know anything, anything could seem legit. Yeah. And then Oric shows up and is like, I'll tell you about that Jade statue. And Habork's like, what do you mean? How do you know about that? He's like, oh, I know pretty much everything about you. That you were, I know about Shaikh and who she used to be. And I knew that you guys broke out of the Otatural mines. And I know so much. He's like, how do you know so much? <laughs> He's like, uh, I don't reveal my sources. Not going to tell you. I don't reveal my sources. <laughs> yeah, exactly. They've requested to be anonymous. Thank A lady you. never tells. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so... I thought this was awesome. I, I'm completely uh, uh, curious about who Oric is and what the what the deal is there because Same. he keeps like 
being, you know, cagey about it and we don't follow up. And he's like, oh, I'll tell you. Don't worry, I'll tell you. And then at, at the end of that scene, he's like, he does tell them. He's like, but we don't, you're not telling us. <laughs> yeah. He you know, does tell that, them and it seemed and huge. And Borek really <clears throat> was surprised. <laughs> anyway, on to the next chapter. It's like, well, no. Come on. Yeah. Come on. Yeah. I yeah. really, I like that as well. And Lorik is like, he is the, the, I think I brought this up last week or whenever we've, we talked about him, but just to like solidify my memory. When Shaik, you know, Felicin was making her first appearance as Shaik and she made those priests kneel to her. He was the one who like did it really slowly. And she was mm. like, gotta watch out for that guy. Yeah. Right. I think so. He I think was the, the one, one where that, it was like there was like a respect element yeah. to it, where it wasn't like "gotta watch out for that guy; he's gonna stab me in the back." It was like "gotta watch out for that guy; he's the smartest one." Right. Was my understanding, I and I think it's this correct. one. Correct. <clears throat> yeah. Um. They also talk about Spirit Walker Kimlock, who we know is the one who gave Fiddler that Tano song. And they talk about how the Tano sorcery is elliptical. And uh, you, in order for the, the song is begun, but it hasn't ended yet. Mm. That whole sequence, that whole discussion, really interesting stuff. Um, and they talk about these two events that might be, um, you know, he, he says there was a, a, a when a Tatarol was created with, from the draining of sorcery, annihilating all the energy around it. Which I thought was cool. It, it, he talks about it like the slag from when ore is burned out. Yeah, and then, and then talking about a Totoro, like it was created in order to stop these things, but the only thing that could create that much of it, it's almost like a ritual. The same yeah. way it would take life from perhaps a bajillion now bone yeah. people. Yeah, he's like, yeah, either the ritual of Talon that all the bone people did, or maybe that one ritual that called down the crippled god. Mm -hmm. uh, into the mortal realm. Anyway. <laughs> 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 Who knows, really? <laughs> I gotta yeah. go so find out. <laughs> uh, all right. So um, next up, we have, uh, you know, Karsa leaves and it's the, you know, he said nobody was there to see me off before and now he has the spirits of Bayroth and Delam to see him off. That was pretty yeah. nice. And we have this cool scene where we get for the first time the POV of Corbolo Dom and Chemist Rillo. Mm -hmm. And they're watching Carsa leave. And they're both sitting there going, <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> yes. Yeah. So they they want Febril to kill Felicin, Tavor to kill Febril, and then the dog slayers to defeat defeat Tavor. That's their grand plan. Mm -hmm. And then they will be the ones who crush the rebellion and be able to impress the empress. Yeah. They want, they want all the power for themselves. Right. And like through their little like schemey talk, they reveal like Hebrick, the tea that he's been drinking that he says calms him down and makes him feel better is actually, you know, thinning the reality. Like they called it like the thinning of like the fabric um, yeah. that it's actually bringing him closer to potentially unleashing whatever it is that is, contained within him which was like an interesting little tidbit there um yeah and corbolo is uh, uh reveals himself to be a real jerk face <laughs> where he, he's talking about you know destroying all the other races from the world and destroying magic real uh oh real, yeah real fascist <laughs> yeah real fascist and yeah, yeah. they want to they want to use otaro they want to obliterate magic because if if all the magic is gone it levels the playing field such that their army is the biggest, baddest, best, and they'll be right. able to destroy anybody. Yeah. Uh, chapter 11 starts with uh, Gamut's POV in this really, I thought, lovely uh, reckoning with the events of Dead House Gates, where they are there on the the road to Aaron, seeing this new this place that has now become known as the Fall, the place where Coltane died and this it has become this sort of hallowed ground where people are coming from all over and leaving uh tributes uh and honorifics you know to 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 uh what happened there 
And even the, the people that were sort of against Coltane recognize the need to do that or sort of have, he's elevated even in his enemy's eyes from mm -hmm. what happened. Yeah. All these he other was... tribes that were, you know, ostensibly fighting against him now are even bringing their own tributes and leaving their own. Um, they want like a Pete, like the, they want to have within themselves the, what he was to his, yeah. the chain of dogs. Yes. Um, I just thought the description of all that and the recognition that, you know, that Gamut has about uh, how hard this is going to be for Tavor. Like she was like, oh, it's, it's nothing to do with Coltane anymore. Oh, and yeah. It still has everything to do with Coltane. And yeah. he still wants to, needs to trust her and all that stuff. And then we get, you, I'm sorry, didn't you want to say something about that? I was just saying, say, and then I yes. just liked that they were like, oh, does this seem like a lot? This is nothing right. compared to further down the road. Yeah. It just continues and continues. Uh, and then we get um, Fiddler slash Strings' point of view of the same area as they're marching through this same, um, you know, the, all this, all, all these tributes and and all, you know these grave sites, and they're talking about um, um, Duiker and what he meant to it to the cause and all that. Mm -hmm. I just I loved all of the revisiting of the fallout of this incredible moment that lives in my mind and the fact that it it's still all of that still permeates and they have to deal with it wasn't just this climax of, of one novel and we're done with it it really meant something and continues to mean something mm -hmm. which i loved agreed um they're moving through this area and uh, i think this is about when we find out that um so one of the man the sorry i'm no a lot here this for like such a short chapter i felt like there was like yes. lots of like this piece this piece this piece this piece this piece yes um the, you know, the, this is when Fiddler is talking to Gessler. Gessler, of course, knows that he's Fiddler and not Strings. And they are having this sort of honest conversation about the tree that Duiker was uh, was crucified on. And we know at the end of Dead House Gates, Duiker and Stormy and Truth walked up and you know saw his body. But there's something that happened in between that and now where the body has disappeared. And they also reveal that they know about the necklace that was around Duerker's neck mm -hmm. that we know is magical that was supposed to be for Coltane, but he get, gave it to, to Duerker. Um, uh, and don't they specifically call out like, oh, that, that we knew that Coltane would be fine. Yeah. And so yeah, we knew he was going to be resurrected and he, and they're like, has he? Yes, he has. Which I thought was kind of a big deal. <laughs> a big deal. And they're like, oh yeah, the baby yeah. was born. Now the crows came. That's it. I was like, yeah. oh, okay, well, cool. Confirmation to that. Yeah. I guess we'll uh, see how that goes. Yeah. And then the horn sounds are like, okay, back to marching in this awful <laughs> train. Uh, and then we get this uh, awesome scene where Gamut goes to Adjunct Tavor's tent and she's like sealing her otateral sword inside a, Another inside a box, box with wax, like to completely seal it away. And we don't really know why yet she's doing that, but it's awesome that she's literally just making space for magic to happen in her tent. Mm -hmm. You have I to love do that in order to allow sorcery magic to, to happen. Yes. I love that. And just like every time Tavor is around, aside from like, or even when there was like, we saw the glimpse of it when the soldiers were all disorganized. And it was like, we got to whip these soldiers into shape. And Tavor is sitting there, and despite that, that was like the most disorganized we've we've seen her. But even then, she's making the right call to say, okay, Gamut, the person who's supposed to be running this, he's not going to take the embarrassment of this. I'm taking it. She's right. so put together, even that she's like, all right, welcome, Gamut. She's just finishing, just finishing sealing this thing. And she's like, get yourself some wine. And he's like, I don't want wine. And she's like, get yourself some wine. Here's why you should have it. Please have the wine. And then as she's like finishing that, the portal appears with – um. Uh, topper the yeah. head of the claw comes in yeah and she's like would you like a guessler please get him some wine he's like 
I guess you can have this one. She just seems like she's so mm-hmm. prepared yeah. at every turn. Come here, stand here. All right. Portal here. Great. Give him the wine. Yes. Oops. It's like, I love that the way that she's portrayed because you know that she is feeling feelings about her siblings. You know that she yeah. is in this precarious position, but she's never seen that way. Right. And well, I, Gamut will see a crack here or there. You'll see Gamut will comment, oh, he, for just the slightest moment, he'll see her have like a, flicker a of vulnerability. Yeah. Um, and and he, for him, he has to like maintain this faith in her. And there's all that wonderful exchange about what faith is for mm. soldiers and how faith is super important and you have to have it. I thought that se- sequence was gorgeous as yeah. well. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, this is awesome. Topper basically comes in as like, I got good news and I got bad news. <laughs> uh, good you know, news and, is your brother's fine. Yeah. And he, you know, restored your family name. Bad news is by him restoring your family name, by the way, everybody thinks you're worthless. Right. And not only that, but a lot of people are dead. Yes. <laughs> a lot of the Malazans died. Uh, Dujek's host is... Uh, a sliver of what it once was. And they're going to be late. And they're going to be late. And all the bridge burners are dead. Oh, and by uh, BT dubs, whiskey Jack is dead. Uh, mm. So, you know, and, and honestly, because of all this, you didn't even have to send Phyllis into the mines, but you did Yeah. anyway. Yeah. Pip, pip. <laughs> pip, pip. <laughs> so that's basically my report. Update. What's yeah. new with you? <laughs> Uh, I also love this little moment we have with Bottle, mm-hmm. the, the squad mage, who the way his magic is described of using all the critters, the vibrations in the air that the critters uh, feel, and he can interpret them because he can speak language. Yeah. Um, but but the, the critters don't. They just feel the vibration, and he feels the vibration through them. Mm-hmm. And so – because he's connected to them, you know, uh, that was love- so rad. And so that's, he, he can eavesdrop on that whole conversation. I just, I also love that he talks about it in a way where he, he's not talking about it. He's like, I'm over here. I'm listening. I'm not using magic. I'm using nature. Right. And it's like, that's pretty magical. <laughs> well, but it, I love that there's this distinction of like, there's the Warrens, which yeah. is sort of like what most mages use. But there's also this older version of magic that is even deeper seated mm-hmm. in the fabric of the – it's the force, right? It's, yeah. it's all things connected. There's some ineffable energy that well, is connecting all living uh, living and non-living magic. things. Like yes. when in Memories of Ice or was it yes. Memories of Ice or – at some point they were like, oh, yeah, we just – we talked to the spirits. No, it was a Dead House Gates. Because they were like, we don't know how we're going to get across here. And Nil and Nether were like, right. there are some old spirits here. We talked to them. They kill people. <laughs> right. It's fine. But we got to yeah. take care of that thing. It's going to kill everybody now. Right. Um, yeah. Just yeah. old magic. We've whole only discussion, seen glimpses. Yeah. In, in Raraku about how you know the, the old magic was sort of dampened and, and, and um, underneath the surface. But it, it, it was sort of um, being held back in some way. Mm-hmm. Um, interesting dynamic. And then yeah. Bottle comes back to where Strings and Gessler and everybody is and is like, I got bad news and bad news. Yeah. Uh, basically just uh, tells everybody what he overheard. And, um, you know, it does not go over well. Everybody is sad to hear of Whiskey Jack's death and the and the uh, what they think is all the deaths of all the bridge burners. Mm-hmm. Um, and... Fiddler just kind of goes on walkabout. It's like I'm gonna leave. He like, um, yeah. I feel like he goes into shock. He just, yeah, pieces out instantly. Yeah. Um. And uh, he comes upon Cuddle the Sapper by a fire, and they have this like exchange. He's like, um, is, is it come? Does he come upon Cuddle? He comes about uh, Con Cuddle later. He Oh, sorry. Yes, I skipped. Yeah, he walks into the desert and it's Timul. Yes, uh, Timul. Right. And, and it was interesting the way it was described because, you know, we're in Fiddler's mind and, and the shock that he's going through. And he just walks until he realizes how far away. And it's described yes. as like you hear th- this crying. And I'm like, oh, that must be Fiddler. 
And then it's like, no, it's somebody else's out here, feelings right. and feelings. And Filler goes in there, he's like, we don't have to talk about this. We don't even have to look at each other. We're both just going to feel some feels. Um, yeah. uh, really yeah. beautiful. But Timmel is having this, you know, this crisis of leadership because um, he's so young and mm -hmm. everyone, you know, you know, it's kind of doesn't trust him, undermines his, his authority. And um, they have this moment like, of connection. Be <laughs> yeah. 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 Um, just beautiful. But you're right. That happens first. Mm -hmm. And then. And a um, fiddler tells Timmel to take the horses away. It's like, oh, yeah. yeah. It, literally, like, get off your high horse <laughs> and walk yeah. with the rest of us until you can stop being a piece of crap. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and then we have um, Topper, basically, uh, we're back in Tavor's tent. And like we said, he, he explains that the, the sacrifice of Felicity might have proved unnecessary. Just mm -hmm. like stab me in the heart. Sucky. Yeah. Uh, they talk about Fenner leaving the Pantheon and being usurped by Treach mm -hmm. uh, and how that's going to affect a lot of the warriors who, you know, Believe follow Fenner. Fenner. Yeah. Um, um and then I love that Tavor, as a part of that conversation, not only is she like, okay, I'm like, I'm taking as much of this conversation as I can because it's my responsibility, but she kind of, she's basically like, is that all? You better get out of here before my blade makes your portal close. Like yeah. she shuts it down and you feel the hurt through mm -hmm. her, again, that like scalpel precision to right. what she's doing. It's yeah. very, it's so well-written. I feel you. She's I'm an awesome perceiving. character. Yeah. Yes. It's so interesting. Yeah. Um, and again, the, you know, all these novels so far can really be the story of House Peron, you know, mm -hmm. in a lot of ways, um, but not, not set up that way. Just sort of, that just sort of emerges, which I mm -hmm. think is neat. Yeah. Um, and then the final scene of chapter 11, uh, which I'd skipped to, is uh, Fiddler sitting by the fire with Cuddle. And um, they kind of talk about how Quickbend is, is now a high mage uh, and they think they're going to, you know, they're, they're going to get defeated or Cuddle thinks they're going to get defeated uh, in their next battle as they try to track down and, you know, pick a fight with the, with the forces of the whirlwind. Mm -hmm. And Cuddle's like, oh, all that I care about is killing Corbolo Dom. That's all I care about. Mm -hmm. And Fiddler has this observation that Tavor is cold iron, just like Coltane. She is not hot. She is cold iron, which is exactly what you were talking about. Mm -hmm. That precision, that um, that sort of uh, dispassionate efficiency, yeah. uh, which is so, so well illustrated, I think. Yeah. And well, him saying that he sees that it is in her. It yeah. seems like she is not yet grasping it or using it. She doesn't have the efficiency or the the experience that Colton has, but he sees that sort of same potential in her. Yeah. And the chapter ends with him saying, okay, I could see it in her. You know, again, looping back to faith. I have to have faith in her that this is going to come through. And now I have to find the same thing within myself because it just, he's not feeling it and he's got to get there. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting scenes. Interesting mm -hmm. chapters. Um, this ends the sub book. We're about to start book three, which is called something breathes. That's ominous. I know. Uh, very cool. But, uh, I, I, there's a lot of stuff to like in here. As, as we've said in the last few chapters, I feel like a lot of this is sort of setting the table, uh, stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, we're almost, we're almost halfway through the novel and I feel like it's sort of like resetting the table for some, for where it's going to go in the second half. Um, but I'm, I'm intrigued and we have a lot of things happening on a lot of different fronts. Anything you're, you want to comment on to wrap this up? No, uh, no, nothing in particular. It's, uh, I think you, yeah, I think you summed it up great. Well, that brings us to our sentences. Um, some beautiful, beautiful language in these chapters. I had a hard time choosing. Uh, do you have so a <laughs> sentence you want to start with or a section you want to start with? 
Yeah, the one I want to start with is the one from Cutter um, in chapter nine. It's a little bit longer. Yeah. And uh, it's Cutter sort of talking about realizing that Absalar is not like super into murder. It's just (laughs) a means to an end. Yeah. Cutter had once imagined that competency was a reward in itself, that skill bred in its own justification, creating its own hunger from that hunger, a certain pleasure. A person was drawn to his or her own proficiency. Back in Darugistan, after all, his thieving habits had not been the product of necessity. He'd suffered no starvation on the city streets, no depredation by its crueler realities. He had stolen purely for pleasure and because he had been good at it. A future as a master thief had seemed a worthy goal, notoriety indistinguishable from respect. But now Absalom was trying to tell him that competence was not justification, that necessity demanded its own path and there was no virtue to be found at its heart. He'd found himself at subtle war with her, the weapons of those silence and veiled expressions. Silence and veiled expressions. My goodness, a beautiful section I resonated with me as well. Yeah. What 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 did it mean to you? Uh that section there's uh been not not to like just like dive like too personal, but it's something I feel like I I personally am struggling a lot with. There's things that I have gotten I have a very hard time saying no to things. And uh because I, I because I like doing them, maybe, but because I'm good at them. I do a lot of right. speaking engagements. Um, I run a lot of conferences. I always say, like, people say, Oh, what are your hobbies? And my hobbies outside of work is typically more work. And I think I've reached that threshold in my life where I'm starting to recognize the difference between those two things. And the things I want to do, the things I care about, things like reading these books and talking with you about them, like I want to do this because I like doing it. In fact, I think I'm not good at it. And going through this has shown me I'm not terrible at it. And I never would have had that if I didn't do this. And things like running conferences is something I'm very good at. And that's not enough to be just good at it. So this is a thing I talked for like like hours about last yesterday because it just, it hit me so hard with like directly the things I'm struggling with right now. and just uh, phrase so beautifully. Phrase yeah, so beautifully. I I love hearing you say that. It's it's a, remarkable mm-hmm. that a fantasy novel can speak so eloquently to things that are happening in the real world. I also responded to that section slightly differently. I mean, I think I think it speaks to the struggle of art and artists in mm-hmm. in a very direct way. Of man, I, it feels good to do the thing that I'm good at, that I like doing. And that, that in and of itself is the reward in the doing, the doing Mm. of the thing, because it feels good because I know there's pleasure in the doing, but then there's this, this necessity thing that comes, you know, and and I, I personally, it, it, it evoked for me this notion of responsibility and, and for me, fatherhood and, my responsibilities to my family and the things that, um, you know, they're, they're, it's not that they're not pleasurable. There, there is pleasure in them, but there is, it is not, you don't feel like you're good at it all the time. You Mm. know, you feel like you're struggling and you're trying to grasp at the right thing. You're trying to do the right thing. And you're trying to, um, it, it is a necessity to be present and be doing that. And what, what, would I prefer in those moments to to do the thing that feels good because I know I'm good at it? Yes, but you're pulled in this other place, this responsibility place, the necessity place. Yeah. yeah. Great yeah. stuff. Beautiful. Um, I have what I think is probably a very um, obvious pick for my first uh, section, but that doesn't mean it doesn't deserve to be highlighted. Um, this is... Uh, again, Cutter talking to Darist, and Darist, uh, you know, he's he's worried about the fact that Absalar might be dead. And Darist speaks and says, "Death is not an unkind fate." Darist mm. said above him, "If she was a friend, you will miss her company, and that is the true source of your grief. Your sorrow is for yourself. My words may displease you, but I speak from experience. I have felt the deaths of many of my kin." And I mourn the spaces in my life where they once stood. But such losses 
serve only to ease my own impending demise. Uh, it's so beautiful. And then Erickson twists it, and the next sentence is, Cutter stared up at the tisty ND. Darest, forgive me. You may be old, but you are also a damned fool. And I begin to understand why Rake left you here, <laughs> then forgot about you. Now kindly shut up. Oh, I just I love, love it. that. It's so I love good. It. The I most almost... beautiful, exquisite <laughs> summation of life. And then he's like, shut your face. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I almost highlighted that section. I so good. agree. It was so, so beautiful. <laughs> and just another little glimpse of my boy, my sweet boy. Yeah. Um, one of the other ones I have here is Lumen talking to uh, Carsa while Carsa is sort of ignoring him uh, in the, the, the grove that he has with all the faces he's carved. The apocalyptic Toblakai, disintegration, annihilation, everything, every human, Lowlander, with our twisted horrors, all that we commit upon each other, the depredations, the cruelties, for every gesture of kindness and compassion, there are 10,000 acts of brutality. Loyalty? Aye, I have none. Not from my kind, and the sooner we obliterate ourselves, the better this world will be. Pretty cynical take on yeah. uh, the human existence um, <laughs> from Leoman, but... But not inaccurate. <laughs> but not inaccurate. And then juxtapose like, the context around that of Karsa halfway ignoring him and... Uh, talking about like right before that Carson says the light fades and that makes the shadows deeper is the light. I now realize that's different about them. And then Leoman goes on his rant and then Carson says the light makes them almost look human. Yeah. And these like him talking about human and, and the brutality and the horribleness with it. And Carson being like, these kind of look human was such mm-hmm. a, yeah. a poetic little intertwining. Beautiful. Loved it. I have one more. Um, this is a uh, Heboric uh, musing about death. He says, the only journey that lay ahead of him was a short one, and he must walk it alone. He was blind, but in this, no more blind than anyone else. Death's precipice, whether first glimpsed from afar or discovered with the next step, was ever a surprise, a promise of the sudden cessation of questions. Yet there were no answers waiting beyond. Cessation would have to be enough. And so it must be for every mortal. Even as we hunger for resolution or even more delusional, redemption. (laughs) Beautiful. It it just has to be enough that you don't have the questions anymore. Yeah. You're not going to get, you're not getting the redemption. You're not getting the, the answers. You're not getting, you're not getting... It just has to be enough to have peace. Yeah, you're not gonna like, you're not gonna scratch that itch, but you won't itch yeah. anymore. Mm. So beautiful. Mm. Um, I have one more longer one, and then I had two single sentences. I had okay. so many. This is terrible. yeah, no, um, that's a lot of good stuff. Uh, this is Fiddler walking into, you know, disassociating. He did not know how long or how far he walked. Each step was senseless the world outside his body not reaching through to him, remaining beyond the withered oblivion of his mind. It was only when a sudden weakness took his legs that he sank down into the wiry, colorless grasses. The sound of weeping coming from somewhere ahead, a sound of sheer despair that pierced through the fog and thrummed in his chest. He listened to the ragged cries, winced to hear how they seemed torn from a constricted throat, like a dam finally sundered by a flood of grief. Hmm. Man. Dam finally sundered from a flood of grief. And then my Just two beautiful. Uh, my two single sentences. One was halfway through of uh, again Carsa, you know, just more change in him seeing himself. If there must be ghosts, it was better to lead them to than to be chased by them. <laughs> yeah. I really liked. Yeah. And then. An, another single sentence of on rack. We are a long lived people who now kneel before short, short term interests. <laughs> God, so good. Um, How does he uh, do it over and over and over again? It's, uh, uh, it's impressive. Yes. Um, having so much fun. Uh, we're on to book three. 
Sub of, book three. Sub book three of novel four. Um, we have three chapters next week again. Big stuff. Uh, exciting stuff. Thanks for being along with us. Again, please, we love your comments. We love your questions. We love uh, your suggestions for opening topics. So please keep those coming. Post them on the YouTube or in the Discord. Uh, I want to hear the theme DLC. songs. Yeah. <laughs> uh, or you can also email us at dlcfeedback at gmail.com. Happy New Year. We'll be back in 2024 for more fun reading. Thanks for being with us. Let's dance it out. When the world's too dark of a place to be And you need an escape from reality Open up those pages and start crying Doing it with your friends, so join the book club.